Welcome GDLers, this is Bruce from Barking Dog Bim, and today we're starting a beginner series on GDL in Archicad 26. We will be scripting a simple IKEA desk, and this is so you can concentrate on the GDL methods being presented and not be distracted by the geometry. We're going to establish some foundational concepts of GDL that once you get your head around them, you will be able to expand on the objects you create and what you can do using GDL. I will also talk you through how to actually read the help files. Sometimes when you look at the help, that in itself can be confusing and hard to understand. So I'll give you some examples on how to read the help. So buckle up and let's get scripting. A handy toolbar to have open is your Edit GDL Library Parts toolbar. And make sure that under your Work Environment, Model Rebuild Options, Interrupt with Error Messages is turned on. Open the GDL Reference Guide, which is under Help Documentation GDL Reference Guide. That will give you the PDF version. The online version can be found at gdl.graphisoft.com and click on Reference Guide. We'll start a new object. It's either under File, Libraries and Objects, New Object, or it's this button here on your toolbar. We'll restore down using this button up here. On a Mac, it's right click on the tab and choose Undock. Let's set the subtype, which in this case will be Model Element Furnishing Table, and fill out our details. Typically, the author is whoever pays for the part. Your license, there are a variety of options here. If you're unsure which one to choose, just click on the I next to it. It will take you to the relevant link and fill out the description. In the description, I like to say who created it and when it was created for future maintenance of the part. And the keywords will be table and desk. Now we'll set up our parameters. What I like to do when creating an object is I like to open an existing object of a similar type so that I can copy and paste across. In this case, I've got another IKEA piece of furniture that I've created. So let's open that and use that. I also like to separate the open objects with a model view tab just to help organize my thoughts. Let's create the parameters that we need. In this instance, I'm not going to use the parameters that come with the subtype, GS leg mat and GS top mat. And the reason for that is that makes it harder than just to copy and paste across from an existing object. So I'll hide these. Now that I've created my parameters, let's set our defaults. So the table width will be one meter, table depth, 600, height, 730, and turn off show hotspots in 3D. I'll set my default attributes to match my company standards. Resolution is how many segments will be in a circular item. 16 is a good balance to start with. Now let's save our object. I'll save it to an embedded library. You should always save it to an external library. The danger of saving to an embedded library is if the file crashes or if you somehow get into an infinite loop with your coding, your work is lost. If you saved it externally, your work is OK. I like to copy in some starter code just to help get my thought processes going. And it also is a secondary prompt as to which script I'm in to make sure I don't actually code in the wrong script. Before we get started scripting, it's important to know that Graphisoft have defined how they would like you to format your scripts, and they have a style guide for your reference. In the PDF, it's under Miscellaneous, GDL Style Guide, and in the online version, 
It's under GDL Docs Style Guide and Technical Standards Style Guide. And you can see that they basically have the same subheadings, naming conventions, expressions, and so on. It's pretty boring reading, but it's important to know that it's there. Now, the GDL editor is due for an update in Archicad 27, due out later this year, 2023. And that will definitely help in this regard with formatting your code in a consistent manner. So let's get scripting. In the 2D script, make sure that you have your project2 command turned on whilst you develop your 3D script. That way you don't have to worry about the 2D until the end. You do your 2D script after you've got your 3D script all working. But in the meantime, we'll have the project2 command turned on. In the master script, we will add some fixed dimension variables. So we'll have the desktop thickness, and that will be 35 millimeters. We'll have the leg diameter, and that will be 40 millimeters. We'll have the leg height, and that will be ZZYZX, the height of the desk, minus the desktop thickness, which will be desktop thick. And we will also need the leg offset from the corners of the desk, and that will be 85 millimeters. Now under our 3D script, let's add some subroutines. And now let's copy across the code that we need. So what have we got in the way of commands? We've got a resolve, pen, section attributes, a couple of subroutine calls, a couple of material statements, and a prism statement. So let's have a look at those. The first one is resolve, which is resolution. You'll find that under your GD help, under attributes, directives, directives for 3D and 2D scripts. And we can see here that the command is resolve with a number, and that number must be greater than or equal to three. And we can see a couple of examples. Resolve five, we'll give it five sides. Resolve 36, we'll give it 36 sides, which is, as you can see, a lot smoother. Even though resolve can be any integer three or more, if you're using it to control the roundness of a shape, it's good practice to use multiples of four. That way you will always have a vertice on a cardinal point. Why does this matter? If we have a look at our axes, like so, and our circumscribing circle, like so, then if we set our resolution to four using the command resolve four, we will get a diamond shape and we will get vertices on the four cardinal points. If we set our resolution to eight, the resulting shape will be an octagon, again, with vertices meeting on the four cardinal points. If, however, we set our resolution to six, which you probably see often, it's not a multiple of four, and this is the result. We get vertices on the x-axis, east and west, but on the y-axis, we are dimensionally short. And if we are projecting an elevation from the side, then our shape will not be represented dimensionally accurately. This is why it's a good practice to use multiples of four for your resolution. Next is the pen command, and it simply sets the contour or the outline pen of the following geometries. And the command is pen with a number. The limitations are it has to be greater than zero and smaller than or equal to 255. And it will just set the pen, both color and pen weight, from the current pen table. Then we have section attributes, the second version. 
and this is for use with building materials. And the statement is section attributes to contour pen. Now, even though it says contour pen here, it's actually the cut pen that it's defining. And an optional statement is the line type as well. So you can set your cut line type to dashed or some other line type that you prefer. Now, the reason I'm using the second version is because the first version was for use before building materials became part of ARCHICAD. And in this one, you had to define the fill, background pen, and fill pen as well. But as these are all part of a building material definition, all we need to define is the cut pen. Subroutines are a great way to organize your scripts. They keep the code tidy and easy to understand. The two main commands to define subroutines are your go sub and return. To properly set up your script in an orderly, structured fashion, you have a header script at the top and your subroutines below that, as many as you need. You could think of it kind of as the header script being a table of contents and the subroutines being the chapters. The header script must have an end statement to stop the script. Otherwise, it will just keep running down into the subroutines and you'll get errors. To properly declare a subroutine, it needs what's called a label. So I have my subroutine name with a colon on the end. And it's that colon that turns this into a label. I also must have a return statement. Now, labels can be either text in inverted commas or numbers but it's the colon that is important. I prefer text as it's more descriptive and easier to understand. In your header script, you may have some starter code and then you call your subroutines using the go sub statement. You must be exact in the use of the label name, including capitals. This is one of the few instances when GDL actually pays attention to case, uppercase, lowercase. This will then jump to the subroutine, execute the code, hit the return statement and jump back up to where it came from to the next line of code. The next example uses a conditional statement that will only execute the subroutine if the condition is met. If it is, it will jump to the subroutine, execute the code, hit the return statement and come back to the next line of code. Then the compiler will hit the end statement and stop running. It's very important that you don't use the end statement in either the master script or the parameter script. Otherwise, your entire object will stop running. Next is the building material command. And you can see that it's set building material name or index with the options of overriding the cut fill pen, cut fill background pen, and the override flag. Now, because these items are in square brackets, they are optional. So we only have to use building material with the name or index. And that will set the building material for the subsequent geometries. Then there is the material command, which is set material. Again, because set is in square brackets, we don't need to use it. It can just be material, name or index. And that will set the surface of any subsequent geometry. These commands from resolve through to material are all found under attributes directives. Next is the prism command, which we find under 3D shapes, basic shapes. I've used the prism underscore command as opposed to the prism command because the prism underscore gives me control over each generated face with a status code, whereas the prism command does not. Similar to the prism command, but any of the horizontal edges and sides can be omitted. And the limitation is that the number of sides must be greater than or equal to three. So as you format it in your script, you've got prism n, comma h comma x1 y1 s1 dot 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 xn yn sn the dot 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 is a placeholder for extra lines the n in the last line here is the same as the n you declare after your prism 
And what it stands for is the number of coordinate lines. So you can tell the X1, Y1 stands for your X coordinate, Y coordinate, and the S1 is a status code. So in the case of our desktop, we'll have our X and our Y axes. Our first point will be at 0, 0. The next point will be at 0, B. The third point will be at A, B. Fourth point at A, 0. That will draw our prism. One more topic to touch on before we get back to the script, and that is status codes. You will find this under its own heading in the help in both the PDF and online versions. Status codes in the PDF and status codes in the online. Status codes are used for a variety of things in a variety of elements as demonstrated by this list. But the primary things we'll be interested in is edge and surface visibility and curve generation. Status codes is a reasonably involved topic that I'll talk about more in depth in a later video. But for the desktop part of this object, I'll just explain the edge and surface visibility. In the help, you'll see that status codes are made up of a bunch of numbers. J1 plus 2 times J2 plus 4 times J3 and so on and each J can be either a 0 or a 1. So it's a binary system. Now don't get too worried about that at this stage, because if we look at the diagrams they've provided, we can see that for status codes 1 to 7, the surface will be invisible, and for status codes 8 to 15, the surface will be visible. Then there's a variety of options within each of those, depending on which edges of the plane you want to show. Now these diagrams are side elevations of the prism so that the first edge generated is on the left and the last edge on the right so that as you're looking at it it generates from left to right. Now how does this apply to our desktop? So we have our axes here x, y and z and our first point at 0, 0 that I outlined previously. Then we generate our surface to point 2, which is 0B. And we want a vertical line, a horizontal line at the base, and a horizontal line at the top. So that's what we want our generated surface to look like. If we look at our options, we can see that status code 15 suits our purpose. So using a status of 15, we will generate the remaining sides with a vertical line at the start and a horizontal line at both the top and bottom. This is the fundamentals of edge and surface visibility using status codes, and this will get you through the majority of objects you code. So let's now jump back to the script, and you can see for my prism command, I have four coordinate lines generating a height of desktop thickness my X and Y coordinates are as I outlined before, 0, 0, 0, B, A, B, A, 0. And my status codes are 15. So generating a surface, beginning line, top and bottom line. All right, let's have a look. There we go. There's my desktop, but it's sitting on the floor. We need to raise it up to the height that the desktop needs to be at. The prism generates from the bottom of the prism and goes up, so we'll need to add ZZYZX minus the desktop thickness, which we can see here is the leg height. So under the 3D script, we'll add in our transformation, which is add Z, because we're only going in the Z direction, leg height. Let's have a look. There we go. It's raised up the correct height. You can see that our local coordinate system is where we've added it to, and it's an important habit to get into to delete your transformations once you're done. There we go, our local's back down to zero, zero. If you don't do that, you'll get very confused with where that local coordinate system is. You'll be drawing things all over the place. Let's now add our legs. So we'll need to change our building material to the leg building material and our surface override with our leg surface. 
The prism command we need for this one is not a rectangular prism. It will be a circular prism, and that's slightly different. That's here. Prism command with only two coordinate lines. Decrease the indent. It will be leg height, 0, 0, and it will be leg diameter. There are a couple more things to talk about. One is coordinate transformations. This has its own help section in both the PDF and the online versions. And this is how you move your 3D or your 2D cursor around in order to draw things where you want. The transformations are made up of three basic types. Add, which is addition, mull, which is multiply or scale, and rote, which is rotate. Then you have del, which is delete transformations. With the 3D transformations, you have the variations of add x, add y, add z, which just limits the movement to a single axis, or you have just add, which transforms all three axes. And you have these variations for the 3D mull, and wrote as well. For the 2D transformations, there's no axial limitations. You define both with the one command. And for the del command, it's the same in both 2D and 3D scripts. I'll cover coordinate transformations more in depth in another video. This is just to give you an introduction into what is available. So I've done something interesting with the prism command to make it a circle. You can see I've got a 9, 15 plus 64, and a 4,015 plus 64. What do they mean? So let's talk about additional status codes. Under the help, under status codes, there's the subheading additional status codes. And that runs through how when you add certain numbers to your status codes, you get a different result with your polyline. So if I was to add 300 plus my status code, then I would get a tangential segment by length. In my particular case, what I've done is I've done a full circle and the command line is radius 360 for 360 degrees, 4000 plus S. I've also defined a 900 in the first line. And if we have a look at this, 900 is set the center point. So what I've done is the first line is to set the center point at the circle at zero, 0, and the second command is to draw a circle. So let's just have a look at that quickly in practice. I'll start a new object. Under the 3D, I'll put in my prism command. Two coordinate lines. I'll just make it Z, Z, Y, Z, X, 0, 0, and I'll just do 900 here to demonstrate what goes on. I'll make it A divided by 2, a full 360, and 4,000. Let's have a look at my 3D view. And what we've got here is a top and a bottom with no sides. Because if you recall, under my status codes, zero is an invisible surface with no lines. So I put in 915, and that gives me my sides. But it also, as you can see, has given me a line at every segment. And we don't want that. The option to get rid of the leading line is use status code 13. So let's have a look at that. Change it to 913. And I've gotten rid of that line, but you can also see the faceting in the 3D render. And that is not really what we're after either. We're after a nice, smooth representation. The other thing to note is that if I look at my front view, there are no lines for the left and right sides. So that brings me to my use of the plus 64. And 64 is the J7. J7 is special additional status value, effective only when my vertical edges are turned on. And without going into too much of the gobbledygook here, effectively what that means, if, if this is 915 and I add a 64, I get a nice smooth surface. So that's what that status coding means. And it also generates contours 
on the outside of the shape when viewed in elevation. Now to throw a cat amongst the pigeons, I could do all of this with a cylind command. And what's a cylind command? Under 3D shapes, basic shapes, cylind command needs an H and an R, height and radius. So I've commented out my prism, put in a cylind, and I get the same result. So why have I used a prism instead of a cylind? It all comes down to ease of scripting, and in many cases using a prism consistently throughout your script is easier than chopping and changing between commands. So let's have a look. 3D view, there's our leg. But you can see it's in slightly the wrong place. We need to add the offset in both the X and the Y directions. So let's get our transformation. We'll just use a full add this time. It's leg offset, leg offset, and nothing in the Z. Let's have a look. Nothing's happened. Why has nothing happened? If I check everything, that spelling is correct. But if I go back to my master script, I've actually misspelled it here in my master script. So I'll just fix that. And there we go. It's offset. Once again, I need to delete my transformation so that ends up back up to zero, zero. So I'll delete that transformation. There we go. What I need to do now is add my multiple legs. And I'll do this with a loop statement. So I'll add a loop statement here. It's a for statement for i equals one to two, only two legs in this direction. Next i. And what I want to do after I've gone in my offset, added my leg, and come back to zero, I now want to add the length of my table, mirror, and do it again. So I'll add x, a, and I'll mull x minus one. Because I'm looping through twice, and I've got two outstanding coordinate transformations, I need to delete four times. So let's have a look. There we go. There's my two legs, and my coordinate transformations are back to zero. Now I want to add the other side of the desk. So what I want to do is I want to add another loop, a nested loop, and go in the B direction this time. So for J, it must be a different counter. Otherwise, I'll get into an infinite loop. For J equals 1 to 2. Indent all that. And the indents are to make your code legible. Next J, got to make sure that I'm nexting the correct counter. And again, after the I and I've deleted everything, I now want to add Y, my table depth, and then I want to mirror in the Y direction, minus one. And once again, it's two loops, so I'll have four outstanding transformations, del four. Let's have a look. There's our legs. So let's save. Place it in our plan. If I select my object tool, selected, ready to go, place it. Because I've used the project to command, I actually have something to look at and I can tell that that is the projection of my 3D. What I want to do now is create my 2D script, which will have a proper representation, not a projected representation with my appropriate hotspots and a masking fill. So let's come back here, open my 2D script. I'll leave the project2 command on until I've finished the 2D script. Let's open my previous part, copy in what I need. So we'll set the pen and the fill, and I need a poly2 command here. That poly2 needs to essentially match my prism command for the desktop. Poly2 is under 2D shapes, drawing elements, and you can see that there's a few there. They do slightly different things. I'm using a Poly2B, and you can see it's made up of N coordinate lines, a frame fill, 
Now my frame fill is seven, which is one, draw contour, plus two, draw fill, plus four, which is close and open polygon. Then you have a fill pen and a fill background pen. It's essentially drawing a fill in plan. So let's have a look at my 3D script. Got my prism command here. I need four coordinate lines. And those are my coordinate lines here. So let's copy and paste. Change my status code, which is slightly different for 2D than 3D. Save this, have a look. And there we go. We can see that it has a masking fill. I'd like to replace the automatic hotspots with proper hotspots, both in 2D and in 3D. We can see here that my 3D only has the two that I created to start with. So let's flesh that out a bit. 3D script, hotspots. I have hotspot at the bottom and a hotspot at the top, which is my ZZ y zx let's create the bottom row first i could do this with a for loop but sometimes that's more complicated than it's worth this is sometimes easier to not only script but to understand for someone else so i need four hotspots first one's at zero zero second one is at zero b third one is at a b fourth one is at a zero now that i've created them Let's just copy them down and replace that with ZZYZX. There's my hotspots. Now, because the hotspots relate to the special parameters of A, B, ZZYZX, they are automatically stretchable. I don't have to do any special coding to make them stretchy. So let's have a look. I can stretch the height. You can see that the desktop has maintained its thickness. It hasn't stretched. And if I stretch it out of a different size, you can see that this offset has been maintained and my legs are still perfectly circular. They haven't stretched. Back to my plan view, I'll just reset the default settings. And I want to replace these hotspots with properly coded hotspots. I can just copy this from the 3D script. And there we go. If I want one in the center, I can also program one for the center. The last thing to do is to create a preview picture. And typically I just do this with the 3D representation because that way the user knows exactly what they're going to get. You take a snapshot. I use Snagit. You could use the Windows snipping tool and Mac has its own screen capture as well. So you just take a preview picture. It's important to keep this image small, so let's reduce its size, resize image to 128. Open my preview picture, and the only way to get a preview picture into here is to paste it from the clipboard. There we go. There's my preview picture. Save my part, and there we go. There's my preview picture. Now, in this case, I don't want the description menu. So I'll just hide that entire sub menu. And I'll do this by hiding the top menu item here. There we go. It's cleaned up. And last but not least, make sure you comment out your project to command like so. What did we cover? Subroutines in the end statement, resolution, setting the outline pen in both 2D and 3D, setting the cut pen in 3D, setting the fill type in 2D, setting the building material and surface, coordinate transformations, the prism and cylinder commands with status codes, the for loop, the poly2b command, and the hotspot commands. That's quite a lot to cover but it's also reasonably straightforward too. And we've created a parametric part that's stretchable where we want it to be stretchable, fixed where we want it to be fixed, with control over the attributes in both 2D 
and in 3D as well. So if I change these surfaces, we have control over that as well. Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you learned something and I hope you give it a go yourself. See you in the next one.